Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this last day of Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Um, my name is Tanya Gustafson, and I'm a pharmacist from South Australia, uh, and I provide antimicrobial stewardship support to SAGA, which is the South Australian Expert Advisory Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. If you haven't heard of SAGA before or you're not quite sure what we do, I'll post a link to the chat so you can head over and have a look at our webpage. This webinar today, AMS, the guts of it, will be focused on the intestinal microbiome, the impact of antibiotics and resistance in enteric pathogens. So today we've got four South Australian speakers all presenting on some very interesting topics. We will aim to keep each presentation down to about 10 to 15 minutes with a few minutes at the end of each for some questions and discussions. So if you have any questions for the speakers, just pop them into the chat function. So our first speaker today is Dr. Jonathan Schubert. He is a senior registrar in gastroenterology and clinical pharmacology at SA Health an associate lecturer at Flinders University and clinical lecturer at the University of Adelaide. He is currently undertaking a PhD on improving outcomes in H. pylori eradication through the University of Adelaide. And his presentation today will be on H. pylori antimicrobial resistance in South Australia. So I will now just hand over to Jonathan. Hi everybody. So I'll just share my slides now. Um, all right, can everybody see that okay? Yes, we can see that. Okay, great. So yeah, the topic I'll um, talk about today would be Helicobacter pylori antibody resistance in Australia, which is an area that I'm currently doing a PhD on through the University of Adelaide. So the topic of the talk will include five main parts. Firstly, an introduction, then a review of some of the historic national data that's used to guide our current eradication therapy. Then I'll give a bit of an update on some of the data that we've had more recently about H. pylori resistance, some of the ongoing work that we're undertaking. Um, and then some conclusions as well from this presentation. So I guess firstly, why is H. pylori eradication important to begin with? Well, gastric organisms were first absorbed, observed more than 100 years ago, but their association with gastritis wasn't really recognized until the 1970s. In 1982, as many of you would know, microbiologist Barry Marshall, as well as Adelaide board pathologist Robert Warren, um, they cultured H. pylori for the first time and for their efforts were awarded a 2005 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So globally, H. pylori is a quite significant issue with more than half of the world's population affected by H. pylori infection. Um, the origins of H. pylori seem to date back to more than 100,000 years ago, so something that's very much evolved with humans over time. It does tend to be most prevalent in developing countries where the prevalence can exceed 50%. But in Australia and New Zealand, we're looking at rates of more around 15 to 30% of the population who are infected. So infection with H. pylori causes chronic gastritis and as well as significantly increasing the risk of things like peptic ulcer disease, some types of lymphoma, and perhaps more importantly these days would be gastric cancer. And in fact, H. pylori is the leading infectious cause of cancer worldwide, um, responsible for up to 90% of all gastric cancer cases globally, which amounted to nearly a million cases in 2018. And perhaps more importantly, H. pylori eradication has been shown to reduce the incidence of gastric cancer at a population level from studies in Japan. So an issue though with H. pylori eradication is that our eradication rates are falling, and this is thought to be due to antibiotic resistance and has been observed worldwide. This was a recent um, review um, in published in gastroenterology that reported that resistance to H. pylori of H. pylori to antibiotics has reached alarming levels worldwide and does need further attention. So declining rates are driven mostly by antibiotic resistance, in particular to clarithromycin as well as metronidazole. And ultimately, this overall picture is culminated in the World Health Organization designating clarithromycin resistant H. pylori as a high priority for antibiotic research and development from 2017. A major problem with alternative antibiotic regimens is that the prevalence of antibiotic resistance varies greatly depending on which area of the world that you're in. 
And a recent review of the Asia Pacific region showed that there was enormous variation between countries, reporting amoxicillin resistance of up to 37% in Pakistan, whereas in countries like Australia or Malaysia or Hong Kong, it's largely not existed at almost 0%. So what this study really highlights is that any sort of treatment strategy does need to be adapted to country specific resistance patterns. And so our local guidelines very much recommend that we understand local H. pylori resistance patterns so that we can choose the appropriate first and second line therapies. But the big issue here is that for Australians, despite these alarming increases seen worldwide, there hasn't been a single Australian study reporting primary antibiotic resistance since 2002, which is now sort of 19 years ago. In fact, the last study that reported this within Australia showed that there was a marked increase in erythromycin resistance with a fourfold increase between 1996 until the year 2000, with rates increasing from 3.8% up to 15.7% over that period. So quite concerning and sort of no recent data to back up our evidence. So in Australia and New Zealand, since, since the early 2000s, metronidazole has not been recommended as part of empiric eradication therapy because of high rates of resistance. However, erythromycin is still part of our first line empiric um, eradication guidelines along with amoxicillin. And this is largely due to evidence of low rates of resistance, which was estimated from data collected in the 1990s, where they thought erythromycin resistance was more around the six to 8% mark. Now, what we've seen worldwide, apart from some very rare exception, is that erythromycin is no longer appropriate for first-line empiric use because of inadequate eradication rates driven by antimicrobial resistance. So with multiple Australian studies showing increasing rates of erythromycin resistance between the early 2000s, it's, I think it's very important that we revisit our local resistance rates. So I guess the first step is reviewing all of the best available evidence to date. And as part of this, we undertook a systematic review and a meta-analysis, looking at studies of H. pylori antibiotic resistance in both Australia and New Zealand. We searched a range of databases and retrieved about 250 studies with 180 abstracts reviewed and about 17 studies that were included for analysis with the flowchart sort of shown on the, on the screen here. So our study comprised of 12 um, review 12 papers that had reported primary antibiotic resistance, so patients receiving treatment for the first time, and five studies that reported secondary antibiotic resistance for people that have already failed prior eradication therapy. And our review encapsulated about 2,500 isolates of H. pylori being a very, very large data set. What we found was that overall our erythromycin resistance rates were around 7%, which is roughly roughly what the understanding was based on our best available literature and our current guidelines, but also metronidazole resistance rates of around 50%, which sort of highlights why they're not used for empiric eradication therapy. Perhaps reassuringly, we found that resistance to either amoxicillin, tetracycline or fluoroquinolones was very low at less than 0.5%. And in the secondary resistance space, we found that resistance was high across the board, particularly for clarithromycin, which is why we never recommend repeated courses of eradication with clarithromycin, um, as well as metronidazole at about 70%. However, in the subgroup analysis, we found that it didn't really matter if the studies were in Australia or New Zealand, the resistance rates seemed to be relatively similar. But perhaps more concerningly was two Australian studies demonstrated a very marked rise in erythromycin resistance in the late 1990s. And so we undertook an additional sub meta analysis of the data, just looking at from the year 2000 onwards. And what this showed was that comparing resistance seen before the year 2000 to resistance seen after the year 2000, there'd been a very marked rise in erythromycin resistance from around six and a half percent before the year 2000 to over 15% at 16.1% since the year 2000. We also found that there was very low variability between the studies with all of them reporting fairly similar outcomes. We didn't find any significant difference for any other antibiotics. So metronidazole and amoxicillin, all the resistance rates seemed re relatively static over that period. So what this data really shows is that there may be an unrecognized increase in erythromycin resistance in Australia, which does ring a few alarm bells. So the key issue that we identified in the study, though, was that we really have a massive lack of up-to-date regional resistance data. And this was by far the largest review of H. pylori data in Australasia until now, with more than four times the number of isolates of any prior study. Although a limitation was definitely that 90% of the data was before the year 2000, with only 10% of the data coming from the year 2000 or onwards. And in fact, the only study that had been published in the last 10 years 
was a New Zealand study which showed that primary rates of resistance were around the 16.4%, again highlighting significant, significant concern that there may be unrecognised increases in pyrithromycin resistance which are not reflected in our current antimicrobial guidelines. Looking more abroad and looking at global comparisons, recent meta-analysis from the Asia-Pacific region have very much found increasing rates of pyrithromycin resistance. So this was a study that was done in the Asia-Pacific, um, a meta-analysis from a couple of years ago, showing that rates had changed from around 7% pyrithromycin resistance up to about 21% until the year 2015. So a quite concerning and increasing rise. And globally, more recent meta-analysis have also shown that the majority of world, world health organization regions, resistance to, to antibiotics including pyrithromycin, metronidazole, and even levofloxacin is above 15%. And 15% is really the key um, threshold that's been identified in international guidelines where empiric eradication therapy um, is no longer appropriate because it will fail to achieve adequate eradication rates defined as 80% or more. So the real question, I guess, as a result of the study was, is really pyrithromycin still suitable as part of empiric first-line therapy? Should it continue to be our go-to first-line therapy along with amoxicillin um, for H. pylori eradication in Australia. So in order to address this, we've looked at some more up-to-date data over the last 20 years, and we've tried to fill the gap that's present in the literature at the moment. So what we did is we studied uh, a range of specimens that had been collected at a single centre for the last 20 years, and any gastric biopsy specimen that had been collected to detect H. pylori underwent routine culture and antibiotic susceptibility testing over this period. Our data set was very big with over 12,000 patients and about 1,500 positive cultures. And we have a lot of antimicrobial sensitivity data um, for the antibiotics listed there, which we've tested against. As part of this study, we also captured demographic data for all patients. And also for a subset of about 10% of the patients, we collected their full endoscopy reports, reviewed their case notes to get an idea of, is this the primary resistance setting or is it more the secondary resistance setting? So the most common reasons for patients having these endoscopies where we collected these biopsy specimens to culture H. pylori were having dyspepsia, anemia, or bleeding either hematemesis or melina, and these variations didn't seem to change over the study period. And what we found was that only about 5% of patients who had cultures over this period was because of unsuccessful prior H. pylori eradication therapy. By far, the, the majority of patients were undertaking cultures in a setting where they had not had prior exposure to eradication regimens. So what we found over this period was that clarithromycin resistance had increased sustainably and significantly by 3.7% per year over the entire 20-year study period. We also found that the clarithromycin minimum inhibitory concentration values also increased by 5% per year, year on year throughout the study. And this increase was most marked in the first 10 years of the study, where the average MIC value increased by nearly 10% per year for the first 10 years, which was statistically significant with a p-value of only 0.01. Over this entire study period, we didn't find any changes for other antibiotics with, a, with metronidazole, tetracycline, and amoxicillin resistance, all remaining largely unchanged. On the slide in front is just a graph of this trend over time. You can see in the, the blue line there with clarithromycin, as well as its associated trend line of the average resistance over that time, there's been a slow but, but steady increase in resistance over that period, with current rates of resistance very much exceeding the 20% mark. In fact, since about 2010, the average rates of resistance have, have uh, on average, um, we've seen more than 20% of isolates resistant to clarithromycin since 2010, and that's well above the 15% mark that international guidelines would say it's appropriate to use clarithromycin in. And more, more concerningly, perhaps, in the last two years of data capture, we had close to 30% rates of clarithromycin resistance, really questioning its use um, as, as being appropriate in the empiric eradication setting. So definitely our findings do support the results of our earlier systematic and review and meta-analysis that clarithromycin resistance has risen, and that's certainly not being reflected in our local guidelines. And what we've showed in this study was that the magnitude of increase of antibiotic resistance to clarithromycin was very comparable to what has been seen in other countries around the world, particularly areas of Asia. So in terms of ongoing work from here, 
There's a few things that I think are important from here. I think firstly, a multi-center approach looking at, at antibiotic resistance in other states to look at more of a national view of what's been happening with resistance is important. And we're currently undertaking a study with the University of Western Australia, where we're looking at basically all of the culture results for the last three years, both in South Australia and Western Australia, to develop a multi-center data set so we can have the most up-to-date um, current rates of antibiotic resistance. I think it's also important that we sort of further look into which patients will benefit most from eradicating H. pylori. At the moment, we would recommend that for any patient that has H. pylori, we would, we would offer them eradication therapy. But the reality is that some patients will benefit a lot more than others. And I think some further work in this area to identify which patients will have most benefit is something that would be quite important moving forward. So in terms of the conclusions from this talk, I think there's both global and local evidence that the prevalence of primary resistance of H. pylori to clarithromycin has increased. That's true in Australia from the data that we've just seen, as well as being true internationally. Without question, though, we need further data. We need data from interstate areas as well to see whether or not the trends that we've observed are generalizable to the rest of Australia. And I think a good uh, focus for the future would be to establish a national H. pylori database so that we could guide and monitor resistance patterns and therefore offer the most appropriate eradication regimens for our patients. And that's it. Any questions or comments at all regarding this? Thank you, Jonathan, for that. Um, if anyone has any uh, questions, just pop them into the chat. I, um, I do have one here for you. Um, so what are your thoughts on the current recommended um, duration of treatment in the therapeutic guidelines, which is currently seven days? Do you think it's potentially aggravating the problem of resistance due to that under treatment? Yeah, absolutely. So certainly um, recent reviews have shown that 10 days is superior to seven days. You get higher eradication rates. And in fact, more recently, there's been reviews showing that 14 days is probably superior to 10 as well. So um, I've been involved a bit with ETG in terms of looking at rewriting some of these guidelines. And certainly the evidence is all in the 10 to 14 day period. I don't think seven days is appropriate. Um, we're not going to see as good eradication rates. But a major issue is the PBS restrictions as well, where they offer a seven day course. Um, and so, you know, it, it is quite difficult in that sense for prescribers. Um, and I think we, we probably should see an update in our guidelines and hopefully an update in our PBS restrictions will follow that. Um, but no, I don't think seven days is appropriate. I think all the evidence would point to 10 to 14 days. And, and that's certainly what I would encourage as well. Uh, a question has come through the chat. Um, so uh, gastrointestinal specialist groups exploring this topic and are there opportunities there? Yeah, so obviously I'm, uh, as a gastroenterology trainee, um, I'm, my PhD involves mostly sort of gastroenterology groups, in particular the Quillers of the Hospital, uh, where I think Morgan Warner obviously is, is working as well. She's been involved in some of this study. So it's a collaborative effort between sort of infectious diseases and gastroenterology. In the University of Western Australia, there's a obviously a H. pylori research group there. Um, and so we've been collaborating with them in order to do this multi-center data set. But Look, we're always open to further collaborations. We would love more data. If there's anybody in the Eastern States wanting to, to contribute to our data set, it would be fantastic. So please send me an email, get in contact with me. We'd be very happy to collaborate. And we're very happy to extend this as, as much as possible to capture as many centers as we can. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for presenting today. It's very much appreciated. Um, oh, sorry, another question has come through just quickly. Um, would, whoops, sorry, a few coming through. Uh, clarithromycin resistance uh, be also driven by its use in CAP being supported by ETG? Well, I yeah, so. I mean, with, yeah, yeah, I think with, without question, um, a lot of this resistance is not just because of H. pylori eradication attempts. I think it's driven by use of clarithromycin for other indications, which can include things like community-acquired pneumonias, um, I think this is a phenomenon that's been seen throughout the world, but just not recognised really in Australia. Um, I, I think that, you know, obviously its role in community-acquired pneumonia and its management is, is, is there. Um, but I think we're going to continue to see increasing resistance over time. I think the question is what are appropriate antimicrobial agents that can give us sort of durable, long-term 
uh, use. And I think amoxicillin is definitely up there because we see almost no rates of resistance to that. I think using it in repeated courses of eradication therapy is appropriate as well. Um, and we don't even understand the mechanism of amoxicillin resistance within H. pylori because we see so few cases of that. So um, I think there are some antimicrobials that are more durable and should be used repeatedly. I think clarithromycin resistance is definitely growing over time. And I don't think that we can, can continue to use that in the longer term. And particularly it's used in things like CAP as well, um, certainly may, may contribute to this growing rates of resistance. And just one last one before we let you go. Uh, who would yeah. benefit uh, the most from eradication? Yeah, very, very good question. I think um, it's a bit of a controversial topic still. I think, I mean, the, the main, from a um, mortality perspective, I mean, gastric cancer risk is incredibly high um, in, in some particular regions such as Japan. And they have shown that by eradicating H. pylori, they reduce incidence of gastric cancer and have more favorable outcomes in the longer term. So I think definitely for people that are at risk of gastric cancer, which may include people that have had changes or dysplasia in their stomach, whether there are people that have got a strong family history of gastric cancer, those sort of people eradicating H. pylori is going to be a big benefit. The other big group would be those that have peptic ulcer disease, so that have gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers. They're likely to have recurrent ulceration if we don't eradicate H. pylori. So I think they'll benefit most from that. I think for, for patients that are, for example, of you know, a 50-year-old overweight Caucasian um, who's got um, significant reflux disease, there's a chance that by eradicating H. pylori, we may actually increase the gastric acid burden and make the symptoms worse. So I think we do need some level of risk stratification in the longer term. I don't think our blanket view of just eradicating everybody who's positive is going to be a good long-term option, particularly as resistance rates rise. But I think definitely people at risk of gastric cancer and people with, with uh, peptic ulceration, I think are what I would identify as high risk groups who are very likely to benefit from eradication therapy. Great, thank you again, Jonathan. Uh, we'll move on to the next presenter now. Okay, so our next speaker is Beck, Le uh, Beck Beasley. Um, Beck has a master's in public health and has worked at the Communicable Disease Control Branch in South Australia for nine years as a public health officer. Prior to this, she's worked in microbiology laboratories in SA and the UK. And uh, today, Beck will be presenting on Shigella resistance in South Australia. So I will just hand it over to you now, Beck. Okay, uh, well, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'll just uh, share this screen, screen one, I'll share. Why does that say that? Um, all right, does that look like a full screen now? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit less technical uh, than the last one on this. And we're just going to talk through the types of cases that we've seen in uh, SA and uh, look at the uh, trends um, compared to uh, national. So first off, though, um, Shigella species uh, isolated by culture have antimicrobial tests um, performed at the time of isolation. So obviously, we're only doing these on um, isolates by culture as opposed to those detected by PCR. And the agents that um, the laboratories are testing, uh, therefore, include ampicillin, amoxicillin, uh, ciprofloxacin, chitramoxazole, and keftriaxone. But not all laboratories test for the same panel of antibiotics. So we um, receive what is done on each one. Um, and increasingly, we're wanting to um, get azizromycin uh, testing done because um, they're resistant to, to the other classes of antibiotics. So uh, first up, I've got to start that timer. First off, um, with the CAR alert uh, gives us a definition of what we're um, calling a multi-drug resistant Shigella. So they make it very easy for us and they say, well, it must be resistant to any of the three, three agents listed here. So we have, you know, a number of the groups uh, represented there with the beta-lactams, macro, um, macro, macrolides and um, fluoroquinones. Uh, so if it's resistant to any of to three of these uh, listed here, then we classify it as an MDR Shigella and um, we can do some work with that. Uh, next. Oh, 
Okay, so um, Shigella is nationally notifiable, uh, but notifications of MDR Shigella have only really been routinely collected here in SA since 2017. Uh, so since 2017, there's actually only been 41 cases reported for this period. Uh, what we're going to do is look at, um, for those 41 cases, the resistant patterns that we've seen there. Uh, we'll look at a number of detections of PCRs uh, for Shigella versus um, culture isolation, and then look at sex, age and risk factors for those cases, uh, the trends nationally and uh, the public health actions and treatment. So of the 41 cases that uh, have been reported into us, I've got a graph here of um, each antibody tested and as I've said um, not all labs test the same panel there so uh, we can see here so ampicillin you know 75% of the cases were uh, resistant to ampicillin but um, and in fact actually all tested were resistant to ampicillin but 25% of them not tested for that um, looking here uh, we can see that you know not many cases were tested for cotrimoxazole or tet tetracycline um, What's important here, I guess, is that we've seen uh, for keftriaxone, we still have quite high resistance levels and ciprofloxacin. Uh, so I put the table there at the bottom with the number tested and, you know, I do understand these are very small numbers, but um, at least we've got an idea of what's coming into us there. Looking at uh, Shigella PCR versus culture, so I've put up uh, the numbers of Shigella reported into Communicable Disease Control Branch since 2015. So we can see uh, in 2018 we had quite a lot of um, Shigella reported in. Um, but you can see this percentage here as being, you know, less than 20% or 25% of um, isolates actually ever being grown by culture. And then, so of those that are actually grown in, by culture, you can then see in the blue here, this is the number of multi-drug resistant um, Shigella that have been reported in. So, so you know, one in 2017, um, it was at six in 2018, 13 in 2019 and 19 in 2020. So there is a little increase um, there over the last few years. And of the Shigellas um, that we do culture, uh, they, we obviously get a species on those as well. And and uh, 38 out of those 41 were actually identified as Shigella sonio biotype G. Uh, so looking at uh, the sex and age group of the uh, multi-drug resistant Shigella cases reported to us, um, if we're looking at males and females, you can see that uh, males absolutely dominate uh, the cases reported to us with only four females uh, out of those 41 reported into us. And looking at the age groups we see, we've got just in 10 year categories here, but we've got, um, so in this 10 to 19 year old, there's a one 15 year old, but it ranges through to 70, 79 year age. But um, with those, you know, uh, I guess, young adults there being represented. So looking at, you know, we've got mostly males and we've got uh, people in that age range from 15 to 79. Uh, what are the risk factors uh, for multidrug resistant Shigella? And so we say that uh, Shigella infections are generally foodborne or sexually transmitted. Um, and in 2019, New South Wales and Victoria reported increases in multidrug resistant Shigella among men who have sex with men. And both states issued public health alerts and implemented changes to manage uh, for the management of those cases as part of their prevention and control strategies. Uh, so back to the ones in South Australia here. So um, the first graph here I've got on the side here, this is a risk factor by um, travel or uh, their residence of notification. So most of um, the cases resided here in South Australia. Um, of the people that had travelled, uh, there were three that had travelled to Central Asia, two to India, one to Pakistan, one to um, Bali, um, one to New Zealand, one to Kenya, a couple to Victoria and one to New South Wales. So um, I think, you know, that, that we're looking at, you know, where is, uh, you know, MDR, Shigella endemic as far as travel goes. Uh, the three that um, have Central Asia there, they went on a, a uh, they were actually all uh, connected to each other. They were a travel group that went on a tour of the five stars. So they went to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, those places there, and um, had all been eating um, salads and uncooked things at the time and all came back with this infection. Um, Obviously, so we've got travel there as, as one of the risk factors, but of course, just because you've got one risk factor doesn't mean that you can't have another. And so 
of um, the cases there that reported um, men who have sex with men with one of our risk factors there, there were 16 of the 41 cases reporting that as their risk factor. Now, the other thing too is, of course, how do you find out if that's someone's risk factor? And we basically ring someone and ask, are you someone that, are you a, a man who has sex with other men? And of course, not everyone is going to say um, that that's a risk factor if, if it is theirs um, and you can understand why. Um, looking at the, uh, back to the people that had travelled, we've got the two uh, cases that travelled to Victoria and the one to New South Wales also reported MSN as uh, their risk factor as well. So I wanted to look at um, MDR reported to, like as a proportion of all Shigella uh, reported in the state. And what I've got here I wanted to draw our attention to is we've got, so New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, so all the eastern states here, um, basically being showing that in uh, 2019 and 2020, they saw dramatic increases in the um, proportion of Shigella's that were actually multi-drug resistant. Uh, the, the New South Wales and Victoria put up public health alerts at the time, as I sort of briefly mentioned, um, that MSN was one of the, was the major risk factor that they saw with those cases. Um, and then just to put South Australian perspective, here we are here in the middle. And uh, so our proportion of multi-drug resistant uh, Shigellas hasn't really increased over that time. And I think it's fair to say that uh, with, you know, we had a, um, you know, social experiment in 2020 where we uh, didn't have contact with people and didn't move states and didn't travel. And I think, you know, uh, so what's happening in 2020 uh, probably uh, doesn't reflect what will happen when we have, you know, people travelling again, and we're likely to see an increase in those MDRs uh, coming into 2021-22. Looking at raw numbers, because we were looking at uh, proportions there, so uh, this one was a uh, national number of cases, and just to show that uh, there were big increases in uh, at the end of 2019 and dropped off uh, when we had um, travel restrictions and, and um, general social distancing and stuff going on in Australia. Um, and then this one is to look at just the number reported. Uh, obviously, we did totals in the last one. And this, once again, just drawing um, attention to the fact that New South Wales and Victoria dominate the, that those large numbers of MDR that are reported in and um, South Australia here, we're, we're a very small um, factor in, in those numbers reported nationally. So just briefly on public health action from here. So obviously when we get cases of um, multi-drug resistant Shigella reported into us, CDCB uh, contact the diagnosing doctor to ensure that appropriate treatment is given. Um, as, when deciding whether a, a treatment needs to be given at all, um, it's important to um, see if someone's actually still symptomatic. If someone isn't symptomatic, you know, it might not be worthwhile um, treating someone with antibiotics. Uh, if we have gone down that track and we do decide to treat someone, we want to arrange clearance testing at the end of their antibiotic treatment uh, to check that that um, infection has been eradicated. Uh, we spend some time talking with the case directly, asking them about their, their risk factors. And we provide education to the case about mode of transmission and prevention. Uh, when we get to cases that work in sensitive occupations like food handling or um, in healthcare or there's somewhere where we think that they've got a, a, a um, greater risk of transferring MDR together onto someone else. Uh, we, you know, we make sure that they're excluded from work, um, and it does make a difference on whether we decide we would insist on someone being treated or not. Um, for those where um, sexual contacts are are identified as a risk factor, we make sure that um, those household and sexual contacts are also contacted and recommend they seek medical advice and testing if they are symptomatic. So, as I said, treatment for uh, multi-drug resistant Shigella, it, um, if someone's not symptomatic, we don't necessarily go ahead with it. Uh, we make sure we use uh, the infectious diseases consultants and uh, the, the hospitals there, and I can see Lido and, and Morgan are on today. They would be people that we would contact for advice on uh, exactly what um, treatment regime we would recommend. Um, this last one, I just wanted to sum up, just saying, look, obviously we are seeing 
increases in uh, multi-drug resistance shigella and uh, sexual transmission is a um, issue, issue particularly that male-to-male -male sexual contact and uh, we do do work with people to make sure that they understand the risks and uh, hope that we can reduce transmission by education of people. So I had a timer on and that takes me to um, 10 minutes, which is the end of the presentation. So I might um, ask if anyone has any questions. I'll, I'll start off with one, Beck. Okay. Um, do you do you think it would be good to get some consistency between labs across Australia with regard to the antibiotics that they test for? And is there any work towards doing that at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I would prefer that everyone uh, tested tested the same range of antibiotics. And I think you know, um, testing for doing that as is remithin straight off would be. Um, very useful for us as a, you know if we go back to um, you know how many isolates are actually um, still sensitive to erythromycin we can see that you know more than half of them still are there and that's you know useful information if we can get um, people treated straight away and I guess you know we can't tell labs exactly what you know they must test for and, and um, obviously laboratories uh, you know have thought, thought through the the panels that they are doing uh, but we haven't necessarily approached to look at a consistent panel that we would test for for Shigella. Lovely thank you so much Beck. Um, we'll keep going through we'll go to our next presenter. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Morgan Warner. She's an infectious diseases physician and clinical microbiologist at SA Pathology. She's the head of the infectious diseases unit at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and chair of the South Australian Expert Advisory Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, SAGA. Uh, today, Morgan will be giving us an overview of gastroenteritis, including a review of Salmonella bacteremian. So, I will oh, hand it over to you, Morgan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Morgan. Uh, okay, all right, sorry about that. I'm just having my, I lost one of my screens when I did that. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can increase this size. Yeah, okay. So thanks thanks for asking me to speak. So um, I'm, I'm, my, mine is a bit more general than the other um, uh, other speakers have, have done. Um, but uh, and my title of my talk, the talk is I have, I'll have my chicken well cooked, thanks. That's really just reviewing some gastroenterology and and and, um, and, and the, basically how we manage an acute gastroenteritis, and in particular whether antibiotics are prescribed or not. Um, so I think people are aware that um, that acute gastroenteritis is a big problem. Um, every year, um, there are about eight, 90 million disability adjusted life years lost and 1.45 million deaths. And um, uh, there's some data from Australia where um, in, in one year, 2010, 16 million people were infected with uh, about, um, a, a, about 1 million of those um, people seeking medical care. So I guess that's one of the points is that people get gastro and only a proportion of them will actually seek um, medical care. And that's probably appropriate in, in general because most, most of the time it's very self-limited. Most causes of acute gastroenteritis are actually viral, and so antimicrobial drugs are not routinely uh, recommended. And even for some of the common bacterial uh, causes of uh, gastroenteritis, Salmonella, Campobacter, Shigella, um, antibiotics are not required for most people because these infections are self-limiting. Um, 
Um, and this is really just to summarize the, the etiology of gastroenteritis, although we can divide it up into the main um, sort of cavities, viral, bacterial, and, and also toxin mediated. It sometimes is in practice difficult to uh, identify um, which is the actual cause. So I've just listed a few of the viral causes, rotavirus, norovirus, adenovirus, and astroviruses. Um, and then the, some of the bacterial causes, Campylobacter, uh, Salmonella, Shigella, and C. diff, which is an emerging um, community onset um, uh, gastroenteritis, which isn't necessarily um, related to, um, uh, to antibiotic use in all cases. Um, then there's the, some of the other ones, Intrahematic uh, E. coli, which is, uh, and, and all the various um, toxigenic strains of E. coli, and then the more or less common Vibrio, Yersinia, and Aeromonas, although you may be aware that we're having a, uh, there's a nationwide outbreak of Vibria parahemolyticus, um, which has unfortunately um, originated in, um, in South Australia. Um, so this is, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but certainly certain features do go along with certain organisms, but it's probably the epidemiological ones that are more important. Um, I, again, I just summarized some of the clinical features, epidemiology, um, and then indications for treatment where they are, and these from the therapeutic guidelines, the treatment um, recommendations. And you, as you can see, most of the time, the treatment recommendations are just short. Uh, when, where there is indicated, they're just short, three days, a bit longer for um, uh, Shigella, and Vibrio, and um, and then if you treat Neusinia um, a little longer, traveler's diarrhea is often sometimes um, uh, recommended to just a single dose, um, but obviously if there's more severe disease, then you would treat for, for longer. Um, and I guess the numbers, you know, basically correlate to the frequency of it. So Salmonella is one of the more common bacterial causes of uh, gastroenteritis. Uh, Campylobacter is, is also um, one of the more common ones. Um, Shigella is probably next in terms of the bacterial one. And then um, some studies have shown some of the E. coli ones, which are harder to identify in a laboratory, um, are also uh, quite prominent as causes of bacterial uh, gastroenteritis. So this is just um, the therapeutic um, guidelines um, shows what our um, the current and current guidelines are. So if you don't know what your organism is, but there's an indication for treatment, uh, these are what currently are treated. So first line would be a quinolone um, um, and um, azithromycin would be another option depending on the epidemiology and then a for more severe disease or where our therapy is not tolerated in Keftrax and will usually cover most of the pathogens. Um, which comes on to, you know, what about antibiotic stewardship of gastrointestinal disease? Um, we know that um, uh, th there's actually less known and less studied um, use of antibiotics in diarrheal illness um, than in comparison, for example, respiratory illnesses. Um, and certainly knowing the extent and pattern of antimicrobial drug use for acute gastroenteritis could help determine whether interventions to improve antimicrobial drug use for this specific clinical, clinical scenarios are warranted. And there's a couple of recent reviews from Australia um, um, that, I've, that I've sort of uh, looked at here. Um, and so this is actually using the Medicine Insight data from the, from the um, general practices. And they, um, there was a big evaluation of, of um, prescribing for gastroenteritis between 2013 to 2018, and about 7% of um, patients um, of the, of the I guess, presumably people who presented with uh, the, 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 the medical problem of gastroenteritis, so about 7% of about 100,000 patients were prescribed an antimicrobial, and of those, 35% was for salmonella and 54% for campylobacter, so those two being the, the more common ones. Um, and so antimicrobial drugs were more likely to be prescribed in patients who, uh, for whom fever had been reported or where there was, or conversely, where no temperature was measured, as opposed to people who were designated as being afebrile, where a fecal specimen sample was requested, where their patient had underlying medical conditions that might make it put them at higher risk um, from an invasive sort of disease, um, or where there was a record of a bacterial or parasitic infection. So I guess one of the key things that comes out of that is that diagnostic tests sometimes uh, drives um, uh, prescribing, which we see certainly see in other settings. Um, interestingly, prescribing was higher in practices that were more remote. Um, but also, perhaps good news is that the study during the study period there was a trend towards less um, antimicrobial um, prescribing over time, and you can see that in this um, in this slide, which shows that it's actually across all age groups um, um, and um, perhaps more prominent in the older age group. 
uh, the question of what antibiotics were being prescribed. And one of the things I did find was interesting was that um, you know, people were potentially having salmonella and campylobacter, and yet nitroimidazoles were one of the higher highest prescribed drugs, so metronidazole, tenidazole, presumably. Um, quinolones, penicillins, macrolides, cephalosporins uh, are again on, on the list. So this doesn't quite match with the PBS um, guidelines for what you would use to treat those um, organisms either empirically or um, as first line. Um, so in terms of what antibiotics uh, decrease, so prescriptions of cephalosporins, quinolones, and nitroimidazoles decrease significantly. Uh, the greatest reduction being for you know the metronidazole type drugs, for, um, uh, followed by quinolones and then cephalosporins. Um, uh, and notably, the, the increase uh, prescription for macrolides increased uh, significantly. So that, that again is, uh, goes to what Jonathan was talking about, the increased use of macrolides in many contexts. And here's another one where macrolides are being used for gastroenteritis, and in, in some cases, certainly appropriately, especially for people um, who have traveled overseas where there may be more resistance. Um, so I guess there's a few studies about what are the common pathogens around um, uh, around the, the place. There was, a, there was a review from Europe, and they actually interestingly reported a lot more of the intrapathogenic type E. coli uh, as some of the prominent causes of gastroenteritis. Uh, so Stridium difficile, another one, um, and, nor and then norovirus and Enterobacter. So when they actually looked for pathogens, but I guess part of the problem is how there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in how pathogens are actually identified. So what you see is kind of what it depends on what you test for. And so there is potentially a stewardship opportunity in, in testing as well. Um, so certainly we know that fecal testing in patients with acute diarrhea is only appropriate when the results will inform management. Um, so if you don't, if the person's well, um, you know reasonably young, they don't have any medical problems, then you probably don't need to actually test. Um, but fecal, well, conversely, fecal testing is uh, required if uh, for things like where you suspect C. diff or people with prolonged symptoms or who have underlying medical problems or in the situation of, of public health importance in, uh, or when a person has a, is a food handler or where there may be some, uh, some concern about passing on the infection. Um, so a lot of the, uh, we certainly at Pathology and I think increasingly at many labs, we do actually do a, a PCR testing of fecal specimens and have a, a panel of common pathogens. And so the advantage of this is that it actually screens for a broad range of pathogens. You get rapid results, uh, the yield is improved, um, and uh, you know, there's less specimen handling. Um, the disadvantages are, of course, that a positive result does not necessarily indicate disease. And interestingly, there are higher proportions of asymptomatic people with positive results and then it's often difficult to know what to do with those and then also when you identify more than one pathogen you're not quite sure which is the primary one. Um, also obviously it doesn't enable antimicrobial susceptibility testing and certainly uh, as for example with Shigella you may not uh, identify a specific resistance clones that may be of uh, public health importance. Um, so there was a study done in Turkey um, of in patients with acute diarrhea, and they actually used a, a very broad spectrum panel as part of a, a part of a way of potentially doing some diagnostic stewardship. So they used a biofire film array, which actually detects twelve stool pathogens. We've actually trialed this, but it's actually very expensive per test, so potentially not the best use um, in you know in a high volume situation. Um, but interesting, they saw again another different spectrum of, of, of pathogens, and this may be reflected by the fact that these were in patients rather rather than community acquired, but a lot of intratoxigenic or hemorrhagic E. coli, norovirus, campi, and salmonella. But again, not the viral predominance that you might expect, but then again, that may be because of the hospital population. So they first of all observed um, what was, um, what, was it, what, what they found, and then they actually sort of presented the results. And, and during the, when they showed people what, what the organisms were, um, there was a decrease in the, uh, in the actual use of inappropriate antibiotics. And commonly, inappropriate antibiotic prescription was quinolones, uh, nitroimidazoles, and third generation cephalosporins. So similar, a little bit similar to what we saw in the Australian study. So again, the, the, the um, diagnostic testing can be helpful, um, particularly if you were having a, a not large number of viral um, uh, cases of, of, uh, in your epidemiology or in things where, or organisms where you, you don't want to treat. So again, I've talked about this a little bit about you know, the indications for antimicrobial therapy. Um, and um, 
uh, I guess the question is where you know we, we talk about why you know why don't you treat for some of these um, uh, conditions and so it go, you go back to 1992 to find the studies that demonstrated that empirical treatment with Norfox reduced the intensity and duration of diarrheal symptoms but the effect was really restricted to those patients who were severely ill and often the effect was only for about one day but um, we did find they did find that the treatment with Norfox delayed the elimination of salmonella, which is one of the things that we you know that we are often say as ID physicians, if you treat salmonella, it'll it'll stick around. But interestingly, uh, it also induced just resistance in Campylobacter. So uh, again, two different problems. You eradicated the Campylobacter, okay, but you you tended to get resistance if it remained. Um, and again, there's other meta-analyses that also had the similar um, uh, similar findings. Um, um, the, I guess the other the other sort of um, issue of importance is the toxigenic. What to do about toxigenic strains? So certain E. coli that produce a toxin, you really don't want to give antibiotics because that could potentially release more toxin and uh, could co actually cause um, you know, inadvertently cause worse disease. Um, the evidence the, is really the highest for the sugar toxin two producing um, organisms, um, but less less prominent um, uh, evidence for the other types of um, of toxigenic strains. Um, um, so again, it, it may not be as high a risk as, as you might think, but certainly for sugar uh, the SXT two type toxin, you don't really want to use antibiotics unless the person is very unwell. Um, just as a you know, a, this I'm just a segue to a, to a case, um, really because um, I, just to illustrate that there are situations where you really do want to you want to treat for people. So this is a, a patient that we had at the Queen Elizabeth a few years ago, who presented with sort of abdominal pain and, and fever, and um, had a CT scan. He was in his 70s, I believe, a um, bit of a vascular path. But you can see on the CT scan that he's got an aneurysm, and you can see that there's sort of some uh, diffuse sort of patchiness around that. So he had actually had a in, in, in mycotic aneurysm caused by um, salmonella. Um, uh, he had several blood cultures positive and um, and was really quite unwell. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the result of that was that he actually had to have the aneurysm resected and ended up having a, an extensive bypass. Um, so, you know, again, consequences of um, salmonella. Um, infection and invasive infection is quite high. And if you actually look at the data with somebody who's bacteremic from salmonella, there, there, there are significant complications of it. So in a Taiwanese study um, of 129 patients, uh, about 40% were complicated with extra intestinal focal infections, the most common being mycotic aneurysms and then pleuropulmonary infections and spinal osteomyelitis. Um, and um, there was a high mortality in those people with mycotic aneurysms, especially if they did not get surgery. So almost 100% mortality and, uh, and high long hospital stays and, and long durations of antibiotic therapy. And the risk factors were diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung disease, and uh, also, you know, I did not mention here, but also vascular disease. So um, I guess in summary, um, you know, the most important thing with diarrheal disease is probably not antibiotics, but prevention of, uh, of uh, infection in the first place. So the standard things, high in hygiene, proper food preparation and storage, avoidance of high risk foods, avoidance of unsafe water, proper infection prevention and control practices in hospitals, childcare and nursing homes, appropriate use of antibiotics, um, appropriate pet selection and supervision of contacts with animals, so petting farms and things like that, and then people with diarrhea not uh, doing recreational activities where they, you know, they might um, inadvertently contaminate water or other environments. Uh, so um, that's all I have. That's just a bit of an overview of um, gastroenteritis and its management. Thanks. Thanks for that, Morgan. Uh, I have a question here for you. Uh, so you mentioned fecal testing only uh, appro uh, appropriately if it will inform management. Are there any good tools ab available to assist prescribers to make de the decision to test or not to test? Uh, I mean, in terms of tools, I think it's really more of a clinical, that's a clinical situation. So looking at risk factors for severe disease, you know, underlying immunosuppression, you know, um, diabetes, those those sorts of things. It's certainly, um, uh, you know, all prolonged di di diarrhea that, that doesn't go away, in association with fever and those sorts of things. So mainly there, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis. So they are, if you look at the therapeutic guidelines, it's fairly good at uh, sort of de delineating the people that, that probably should be um, 
should be should be actually um, uh, where you would want to do store testing. And certainly in an outbreak um, setting, you probably would want to get some information about what an organism is if there's diarrhea in a nursing home or in a school or a, or associated with a particular restaurant or food uh, food, food board area. But that's often sometimes directed by by by, by communicable diseases. Thank you, Morgan. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll move on to our last presenter. Sorry, Morgan, if I could just get you to end the screen share. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Thank I'm you. Just, I'm trying to, um, oh, here we go, stop screen. Thank you. Lovely, thank <laughs> you. So our next speaker, our last speaker, is Dr. Leto Papanicolas. She is an infectious diseases physician and clinical microbiologist at SA Pathology. And she's recently completed her PhD exploring the relationship between gut microbiomes and infection. So I will hand over to you, Leto. Okay, Lito is going to do it from my screen uh, oh, okay, um, sure. because we're having technical difficulties, but we will sort that out straight away. No um, worries. So we will do this now. And maximize. All right. Thanks, <laughs> Um, thanks, Morgan. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? Oh, yes. yes, we can, Lito. Okay, wonderful. All right, so this is also a general talk, um, just because this is a very big topic, just to get you perhaps interested in thinking about microbiome in the context of um, antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. So when we talk, think about antimicrobial resistance, often clinically, I see this happening in a cycle. We have um, anti, you know, microbial resistance is detected, and this leads to more broad spectrum antibiotic use, and that in turn increases antimicrobial resistance. And then you are stuck in this sort of cycle that's difficult to exit. And this not only happens like on a broad community level when the community is using more um, resistant uh, sorry, more broad spectrum antibiotics, but also in individuals. And this can, I think we should think about this as being mediated through the gut microbiome. Um, and in terms of, you know, solving our problems with antimicrobial resistance, we can't just use one tool. I mean, this is a very difficult problem. So infection control, new antibiotics are clearly going to play a role, but we need to think more about alternative ways to to help and perhaps tending to our microbiomes is one way to help. So just to start with, what, what do we mean by a normal microbiome? And even this is quite a contentious um, area because we are all unique. We all have sort of like a fingerprint or different types of bacteria in our gut. But these bacteria um, between healthy individuals share uh, functional capacity. So the ability to digest our foods, to produce beneficial metabolites um, that have a very wide range of um, beneficial properties, which I don't have time to go into. But um, what we need to know about the makeup of these um, microbes is that the vast majority are obligate anaerobes. I mean, our gut is a very anaerobic environment. <laughs> and many of these are in um, the bacteria DTs and Clostridia orders, but there are many that you have never heard of because they're not culturable. And only less than 1% or 1% roughly of our microbiome is made of what I call pathobionts, which have pathogenic, um, but can also be commensals. So these are the bacteria we're familiar with, like E. coli, Enterococci, Pseudomonas. So these are not typically a large proportion of a healthy microbiome. Um, a healthy microbiome is also thought to have a high diversity, so many different types of organisms present and more evenly distributed than unevenly distributed. Um, and whether, you know, you call a 
a microbe good or bad in this context, um, it often depends on its surrounding other microbes. So microbes don't, they're not really individuals, they function as a community. So I like to think about the microbiome as an ecosystem, a very lush forest perhaps. Um, and then when we use very broad spectrum antibiotics, for example, baropenem, this might be what happens to your forest. Um, but then after that, there is a bit of regrowth. And this is the time period which is actually dangerous because what happens is the pathobionts or the pathogens may have the ability at this stage to grow faster than our commensal microbiome, the healthy bacteria. And this is where you can get overgrowth of a pathogen. In this um, example, it's C. diff, but it could be E. coli, it could be Shigella, it could be many things. Um, so one of the properties of an intact, healthy microbiome is actually to prevent colonization and expansion of pathogens. And this property is called colonization resistance. It was actually first observed in mice in the 1950s when um, researchers were trying to infect them with salmonella, but were not able to do that unless they first used ampicillin. So microbiome disruption was necessary to establish um, salmonella infection. And we've since seen that in humans um, with multiple different types of bacteria as well, including VRE, C. difficile, and pathogenic gram-negatives. So disruption of our normal flora facilitates the acquisition of these MROs and their expansion. So in some populations that are highly vulnerable to sepsis, this can be a lethal um, event. So for example, in patients who are undergoing stem cell transplant for hematological malignancy, they experience a significant loss of microbial diversity because they are exposed to very broad spectrum antibiotics during this process. And many develop what's called intestinal domination. So that means they have a very uneven microbiome where more than 30% is dominated by a single taxon or genus. Um, and, if, and this um, precedes sepsis by about a week. Um, it predicts sepsis um, to some degree. So with VRE in particular, um, having intestinal domination VRE increases your chance of sepsis with that organism ninefold. It's less so with the other bacteria, but it's still a significant risk factor for this. Um, and I guess one of the messages I'm trying to get across is that when it comes to the microbiome, not all antibiotics are equal. I think we have a tendency to think that antibiotics are bad for our microbiome, but there are actually very large differences between different um, antibiotics and their effect on the microbiota. Um, in our terms, broad spectrum and narrow spectrum, are not often um, offering much information about their effects on the microbiome. So that may tell you about whether they treat gram positive and gram negative infections or how many pathogens they might cover, but it doesn't necessarily mean you understand their effect on the microbiome. Um, and the other thing we rarely consider is the route of administration. Perhaps in some cases, oral administration of an antibiotic can be much worse than IV administration, which is not normally, you know, what we think about in stewardship. We're always trying to change to all antibiotics, but when it comes to the microbiome, that, that may in fact not be the best option. So um, antibiotics which deplete anaerobes, because as I explained before, the vast majority of beneficial commensals are anaerobes. This is a greater risk factor for establishing MRO colonization. So in this, this is a, a data from mice, and the antibiotic which was the most likely to establish a CRE infection was uh, clindamycin, and that was followed by Piptaz, with um, the antibiotics like Cipro and Kefapine being less likely um, to result in this colonization. And there's other, um, you know, sort of evidence that using um, Piptazus in, in particular can, you know, perhaps um, also cause resistance um, to expand. In, so not using a carbapenem per se, um, although that is also a very microbiome disrupting um, antibiotic, but using a non-carbapenem antibiotic that still is broadly, effect, broadly disruptive to microbiomes can also cause 
the carbapenem resistant um, gram negatives to proliferate. Um, and there's, you know, more and more evidence that in hospital populations, um, using antibiotics that are linked to microbiome disruption um, can increase the overall risk of sepsis um, in the subsequent 90 days. So this is a massive study um, by Bagsonol who looked at 13 million patients, and they classified antibiotics based on high risk for microbiome disruption um, versus lower risk. And that was basically based on their um, relationship to C. diff um, risk. And the use of multiple antibiotics together and for long durations for greater than 14 days, in addition to the use of a more microbiome disrupting drug, were all linked to increased risk of sepsis. However, using a narrow spectrum antibiotic, for example, a penicillin or even cefazolin, did not result in increased risk. So not all antibiotics are equal. So um, just in conclusion, the gut microbiome is a reservoir for multidrug resistant organisms, um, but commensal bacteria, um, our healthy obligate anaerobes in the gut can prevent proliferation of these pathogens. So avoiding antibiotics, which are particularly harmful to anaerobic gut commensals, for, for example, unnecessary use of anaerobic spectrum antibiotics, um, can help preserve the ability of the gut to prevent MRO colonization and expansion. And I believe there should be more emphasis in antimicrobial stewardship um, on the microbiome disrupting uh, potential of the antibiotics that we are recommending. So thank you, and I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you, Lee Cho. Uh, I have a question that's come through for you. So you mentioned that IV antibiotics may be less detrimental than oral antibiotics in some cases. Yeah. Do you think that we maybe need to change our messaging regarding the IV to oral switch? No, I don't, because I don't think there's enough evidence. Like the one major example I can think of is vancomycin, where IV vancomycin has very little got toxicity, but oral does. But then again, we almost never use oral, think, unless it's for C. diff infection anyway. So in the other types of antibiotics, um, this has yet to be studied extensively. Um, and some of them do have very good gut penetration, even through IV administration. So I raise that more as a, something to think about um, and something that really just needs further study um, about, you know, in, you know, in antibiotics where um, say we have an IV and oral preparation like Augmentin, for example, um, does it, you know, which one is more disrupting the microbiome? I don't think we even know the answer to that question. So it's premature to recommend any change, but I just think it's something that people don't think about when haven't studied and it just needs to be, um, you know, people need to be aware of that. Thank you. We have another question that's come through. Uh, so given the recommendations regarding immediate management of sepsis and febrile neutropenia, do you have any comments specifically looking at people treated with PIPTAS following sepsis who then represent with sepsis in the 90-day period? I mean, th there are people in hematology and oncology looking at the question of cefepime versus PIPTAS. And I would, and there, there is some data coming out that cefepime may be less disruptive to microbiomes than peptazacin without having a reduced, you know, efficacy or harm mortality. Um, I mean, obviously, when it comes to febrile neutropenia, the first and most important thing is to, um, uh, re, you know, reduce more immediate mortality rather than try to prevent a slightly more longer term problem. Uh, but, you know, I, I think if there has been, you know, recurrent sepsis, then you might want to try changing your empiric antibiotic to the second line, which would be pain plus an aminoglycoside. Aminoglycosides are often um, not used when they should be as well in neutropenic fever, and they, they are very, have very limited disruption to microbiomes. Yes, they have that other downsides, obviously, like renal impairment, um, but they are probably what the best agent. Um, in terms of microbiome disruption, very minimal microbiome disruption, and um, perhaps a little bit 
being a little bit less scared of immunoglycosides in, in febrile neutropenia or other sepsis syndromes, you know, might result in slightly less use of more broad spectrum agents that disrupt microbiome. But no, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I do tend to like to rotate antibiotics if I don't, if I find tazosin is just not you know, you're not getting the response that you want from that drug or, and especially in febrile neutropenia, it's, it's less about the importance of which agent you start, but not prolonging the therapy beyond what's needed. And there's a lot of just in case, let's just continue this a bit longer in febrile neutropenia. And I think people don't, should not be scared of stopping that antibiotic once there is clinical resolution um, of the fever and the patient is stable, that we may be doing more harm by continuing to treat um, just, just in case rather than just stopping at that stage. Because as a study shows, it's not just the empirical agent, but the duration of therapy that um, impacts your microbiome. Lovely, thank you so much, Lito. Okay. All right, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, uh, Jonathan, Beck, Morgan and Leto for taking the time to present to us today on some really interesting topics, um, very relevant topics, particularly in the field of AMS. And thank you to everyone else who attended. I hope you enjoyed it and found it very useful. Uh, there is a short survey which will pop up in the browser when the webinar ends. And it'll also be emailed to everyone who's registered today. So if you have any comments to leave um, for the presenters, please feel free to pop them in there. And uh, the recording of this will be on our website, which I've posted to the chat as well. So once again, thank you to everyone and have, have a great day.